Namo Narayan, everyone. On behalf of Satyam Sumiran Yoga Research Foundation team, I welcome you all uh, to our fourth edition of the Satyam Sumiran Yoga Conclave. As you are all aware, this is a very interactive session, like our past se sessions that have been that are being held on um, the weekend every month. But the exciting news today is also, as some of you who've uh, attended the morning sessions with Swamiji, uh, we are going to continue to have some specialized sessions um, in the forth forthcoming weekends. And um, Swamiji is going to bring us some interesting topics and he's going to share his knowledge uh, on different different aspects of yoga there are three workshops which we are talking about in this uh, in the following uh, few weeks that are going to happen uh, one of them is yoga and cancer which will be on the 4th on the 6th and 7th of may i'm just announcing this up front but i'll also put it on the chat box later so that everybody can kind of you know um, get those dates in their head. We also have yoga and women's health on the 13th and 14th of May and uh, yoga and lifestyle disorders on the 20th and 21st of May. So uh, there will be a registration link that will be sent very soon on the WhatsApp group and you can all um, join in. But coming back to today's session, today is a very exciting uh, evening. Uh, I'm using the word exciting because, you know, we usually have to travel so far to get an expert. And sometimes we have to wait for so many appointments to find the expert in a particular field. But today with us, we have, um, besides our Pooja, Dr. Swami Yogi Pratapji, we've got um, Dr. Mayura, ma'am, uh, Dr. Mayura Deshpande. Welcome, ma'am. Good evening. Uh, um, and uh, thank you for making it on a Friday afternoon. I think it's afternoon out there, isn't it? Um, so Saturday. a little bit Saturday, yeah. Saturday. Saturday. Uh, Saturday. Saturday. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm I think I'm going backwards. <laughs> uh, so a little bit about uh, Dr. Mayura, ma'am. Um Dr. Mayura Desh Pandey, she's a very well established physician um with some wonderful um years of experience, uh, around 14 years of experience. She settled in the UK and uh, she's got clinical experience in geriatrics, respiratory and acute medicine. And I think the latest feather in her cap is her passion in oncology research. And uh, ma'am is um, engaged with SIA. She continues to passionately grow in this field. And uh, she's also specialized in pharma medicine. And uh, she's also an esteemed member of the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Medicine, Royal College of Physicians. And last but not the least, she's a loving mom and a great wife, and she loves to travel uh, and read a lot of books on spirituality. So ma'am, uh, Dr. Mayura today is going to talk about um, the so-called dreaded disease called cancer. And Swamiji um, will, bring us the aspect of yoga also into this. I uh, welcome you, ma'am, on behalf of the SSYRF team. So over to you. Before we go ahead, I would like also to add that in addition to being a doctor and an expert in medicine as well as cancer, she also I understands understand. very deeply with personal experience, what is the trauma that one undergoes when one suffers with cancer because very recently she has uh, she ha had her mother battle this disease and uh, she had to face that so that that uh, has actually widened her horizons not only to the medical aspect but also to the deeply personal aspect of cancer so with this, uh, you know, inside information, if I may say, let us welcome Dr. Mayura. Over to you, Dr. Mayura. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's really humbling and, and um, so kind of you to say all those wonderful words. I am not an expert. I am just a, a physician who many, many years ago took an oath that I will never do any harm and I'll just work for the benefit of my patients and I continue to do so. And as Swamiji has just mentioned, cancer is close to my heart now, obviously because I lost my lovely mother a few years ago to a very aggressive brain tumor. 
but um, it's been a passion of me to be into research for many, many years. So I'm just very grateful for the opportunities I have had to be here. And again, really thank you for inviting me to be able to speak with all of you today. When I was told to kind of talk about cancer, I was reflecting on how do I actually go about having this talk? And the first thing that came to my mind is back when I was in med school, um, cancer was a disease which was still under evaluation. We knew about it, but not so much. And it was almost like a disease of the few. There were very few people, at least in Asia, as we know, very few people who had cancer. Of the uh, and there was a huge taboo associated like, oh, you had to have some bad habits to be able to deal with this disease. But today, medicine and so much of research that has happened and everything that we see around us, we know that's no longer true. Hello. Just as in the and just one of those diseases which doesn't just impact the, the patient, it impacts the entire family. So I'll probably kind of break my talk into few sections. So let me start by talking very top line about what is cancer. So it's essentially when your, our bodies is a brilliant, brilliant work of art in itself. Everything is self-managed and everything. You don't need to do a lot of things. Your body is just doing a lot of things without you even thinking. And one of the things is in your body, the cells are born they grow, they do their function, and they die, and this process continues. Sometimes what happens is these cells keep on growing or uh, multiplying abnormally, and they, then they get together and form something which is called a tumor. And this can be a benign, which is essentially, it's not a cancerous, it's still cancer, but it's not really bad. Or it could be malignant, which is like, yeah, it can be really harmful. So that's essentially what is cancer. So there's nothing, everybody thinks it's a really something very difficult, but it's just an abnormal multiplication of the cells. That's all cancer is. So why does this happen? When our body is so intelligent and can manage everything, why does it happen? So the basic structure of our body is our body is made up of multiple cells. And the main organ of the cells, which we can call like the control center, is called a nucleus. And in, within the nucleus, there is something called as uh, a genetic material, which is a DNA. Essentially, it's like a blueprint for us. It defines how color of our hair will be, color of our eyes will be, and some of the other physical and internal like other characteristics as well. So this DNA essentially has some genes and not the genes that we wear, but genes in it, on it. And I think when these genes get kind of abnormally uh, either multiplied or reduced in number or maybe kind of replicated, that's when actually the cell gets, hang on a minute, I don't understand the signal. And then it keeps on doing that abnormal multiplication. So that's the basic reason why we have cancer. It's very much around the genetic makeup of our, our human body. So everybody knows that we have a pair of genes, we get some from our father and we get some from our mother, but why does everybody not then have cancer? Because these genes can become abnormal only when there are certain external factors which can affect it to go wrong as such. But that happens a lot of the times it has that internal mechanism to actually self uh, regenerate the cells and actually fight against those rogue cells and make it better so your body is still very very strong in itself but when there are these external factors such as ultraviolet radiation or smoking or Nowadays, now, now we know there are some chemicals. Um, sometimes there are chemicals in the food. They use a lot of um, kind of preservatives. Some of the preservatives are not very good for our body. So preservatives, diet, stress, all of these factors can actually cause our genes to actually go a little bit rogue on us 
multiply or divide abnormally, which can then cause the cells to almost miss the signal and, and then regenerate or multiply and become abnormal. So that's why, that's what is cancer. And that's why one, a patient might, or a person might get cancer. It's, as I started by saying that it was a disease of the few, but it's not so now. There isn't any specific factor that so many patients that we see, there isn't a specific factor we can now put a hand on and say, yeah, that's the reason why you have cancer. So we are still, we are still finding out the reasons why these genes are going the way they are. Why are they changing themselves? Why are they mutating? Why are they multiplying? Why are they dividing in an abnormal way? So there's a lot of research going on. Um, medicine has come a very, very long way, but we are still not where we want to be, which is why I, I'm very passionate about what I do today. Um, on a very daily basis, I speak to lots of clinicians who treat cancers, uh, who we call oncologists, um, and I speak with many, many patients. Um, and I was recently, uh, we had a talk in our company and this patient came and she said one thing which truly, truly kind of stuck to my heart. She said, cancer is a disease of the family. That's true. It's very true. One person obviously goes through it, but it paralyzes the entire family. And I think there's a lot that in medicine we are doing. At the minute, we are trying every single trial, which is where we test medicines. We look at how we increase the survival of these patients. How can they live longer? We are looking at how can we stop this abnormal cell from progressing at a very quicker rate so that we can give the patient a longer time to live. But the one, one thing that for me is very important is the shift in the mindset that's happening is where initially it was all about, oh, I want to get better to even if I don't get better, I want to live a good life. No matter how much life I have, I want to live a good life. So there's a lot of emphasis today on quality of life, which is really, really close to my heart as well, because there's so many patients that I've heard, like they are, they can't move, they are stuck on a wheelchair, they are, they can't eat by themselves, they have tubes everywhere, but yeah, they're living. But I don't know if they're happy with that kind of life. So I think quality of life is very, very important. And that's where medicine is currently going, at least in oncology, that's where medicine is going. We have loads of different types of treatments that we currently have for treating cancers. But one thing is cancer is a disease which can be monitored and can be managed by giving different medications, having different kinds of treatments, but it unfortunately cannot be completely cured. And it goes back to the thing that I was discussing before is because of we don't know yet what is that factor which is causing these cells to go rogue and abnormally multiply. Multiply. We know some of the factors, but we are still not able to understand all the factors that actually cause, cause cancer. So we have treatments, we have oral treatments, we have medicines which you give through the vein, we have radiotherapy, we have many, many treatments, we have Nowadays, we even have things that you can put in the brain, which kind of kills the cancer cells. So medicine is, is really, really growing in the field of oncology or in, in the field of treating cancer. But what we still don't know, we don't know. We still don't know um, why, why is this happening? Why is the, the basic reason of why the genes are multiplying or dividing without actually being able to kind of understand that that's not the right thing to do. Why are they doing that? So we still don't know, and we don't know how we will find that out. Um, um, because it's that we want to next go. I think that's where uh, medicine is now going. Um, well, um, and then the other thing was about, um, I'm trying to find a layman's language. <laughs> um, 
maybe you can help me here sorry because i i'm, I'm struggling to uh, find the words to kind of describe no, the but i think it's good yeah, you can use a little bit of technical language also and okay. uh, uh, then if need be uh, we can explain more about it in the uh, panel discussion okay all right that's absolutely fine so i think there are a few things like um, what we were talking about is um, so one thing is about these external factors which are called as carcinogens so carcinogens can be essentially um, internal as well as external so internal is where they are um, like diet stress that is causing the the cells to abnormally multiply and external we talked about okay so um one of the other things is um, sorry i'm i'm in some um sorry um, can you still see me yes we can we can see and hear you um, mayura oh okay okay I, i don't know i think i had some kind of just um yeah i think i think it's fine now yeah i just had some like message that was popping up okay um so yeah i think that that is basically the kind of the carcinogen and we have in our body as i've already said the genes so we also call it like the onco genes and the onco genes are essentially potentially now what we know uh, after so much of research that are potentially the genes which can be mutated easily to cause cancer and and those are basically what we um kind of say is um when it becomes um if when it turns into a rogue gene it's called a proto oncogene so these are quite significant like scientific terms and um, which is why i was kind of uh, trying to see if i can explain in a different way but maybe how we can think about this is as i said like think about think of a, a cell and think of a cell which is like now through research we know certain cancers we know that certain genes are involved in formation of that cancer so we now in the world of science called this like a nonco gene because that's a kind of gene which is specifically linked to that kind of an cancer or oncology type and then when that gene actually becomes mutated what we call in scientific language is when it multiplies or it divides abnormally then it's called a proto oncogene gene because now we know that essentially that is the uh, gene which is essentially abnormally mutated which is now causing the cells to kind of abnormally multiply which is now causing that cancerous growth so this is all very new scientific language this is something that was not when i was doing medicine many many years ago these terms were very still almost in, still in the development they were not understood so well as we do today um but as i said medicine has grown really really strong leaps and bounds there's a lot of research happening on the cancer side where initially we were treating the cancer with specific treatment today cancer is not treated just as a cancer we have a a team of experts sitting together around the table we have a nurse we have a, sometimes a cardiologist sometimes we have a gastroenterologist depending on where the cancer is we have um, uh, we have psychoanalysts who basically deal with the kind of the mental management or the anxiety management of the patient so it's an mdt level approach so when a patient comes to us no longer at least in in the western world or in in in, in the uk where we sit by ourselves and say oh i know this patient needs this chemotherapy uh, regimen the gone are those days i need to sit with my nurse i need to sit with all these experts around the table and actually speak with them to understand how we are going to manage every single aspect of the patient's life right from obviously managing the cancer itself any symptoms associated with the cancer will there be some pain how do we manage that pain if there is going to be anxiety which clearly there is how are we going to deal with the anxiety and in these countries there is also a lot of support given to the family and the carers because we have many 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 patient organizations who have multiple materials they have multiple leaflets and information for carers so that they know if if they need to speak to someone they have some place to be so 
there's the management balance that has changed drastically. Not just about treating the it's about treating the patient in a holistic way, what we call it in, in the scientific world is as a whole, treat the patient as a whole, but also go beyond and help the families, um, treat, help the carers, people who are looking after the patient. Um, so I think I, as I said, like we have come a long way since the age of um, cancer being a very disease of the few and, and almost looked upon as a taboo to actually understanding to very, very minute details on which genes are involved in which cancer, um, which, um, what kind of specific uh, um, antibody or specific medicine you need to use to kind of target that particular cancer. How do we kind of increase the survival of these patients? How do we kind of slow down the progression of the multiplication of the cells? How do we help the quality of life of these patients? going beyond that to kind of helping the patients, carers, and the families as well. So it's all good, but there's still a lot that, as I said, is not known. We still don't know why these um, cells multiply. How long do they actually keep on multiplying until it becomes a tumor? Why do certain cells multiply and they become a tumor? And sometimes cells do multiply, but they don't become a tumor. So there's still a lot of research that is still happening lots of things that we don't know amongst a lot of the things that we do know. Um, but I think that's the whole excitement is what we don't know, we keep to keep moving and striving to find. And when what we do know, we keep um, strengthening our information on it. So I don't know, I think I covered everything that I wanted to cover in my talk. But uh, is there any, anything specific that anybody wants to ask? Or Swamiji, do you want to do it in the panel discussion? I'm fine with it. I think, uh, I mean, before uh, I can say what uh, I would like to uh, speak about your topic, I would like to congratulate you for simplifying this topic. So uh, bringing it to a non-technical level, because uh, I have interacted with so many oncologists and uh, the bane of oncologists or any doctors for that matter in this field is they speak so much in technical terms that the non-medical people get totally, uh, you know, confused. And scared. And scared, yes. So uh, this is something which is uh, very nice and I, I really appreciate uh, this aspect and uh, that you have mentioned how it is a basically a genetic abnormality basically it is a genetic mutation which takes place and uh, since we have some time could you in five minutes you know uh, give a little bit of an explanation about how uh, the crucial aspect uh, is about some uh, until and unless the blood supply lines I have not set in on the cancer cancerous things. Uh, how even if you have a small abnormal growth, it dies out. How the immune system uh, kills it off, and uh, how multiple gene mutations are needed for manifestation of a cancer. It is not that there's a one point gen, uh, mutation which is there. So if you can, uh, you know, uh, elaborate a little bit about that, that would be really, you know, it would help people a lot. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Um, so again, I think this goes back to the increasing the understanding. So as Omiji has said, I think many, many years ago, we had few genes we knew were associated with the cancer. Today, we know that it's not just one gene. You need to have several genes that need to mutate. And when I say mutate, it's almost like abnormal division or abnormal multiplication. So they're either multiplying. So there's too much of that genetic material or there's too less of the genetic material. So today we know that if, if, a, patient, if a patient forms a cancer, there are types, because we have more than 200 types of cancers. So there are some types where essentially 
there's only one gene involved, but most of the chromosomes will have more than one gene involved. And when I say that, what I mean is, it's not just one gene which will essentially cause the cancer. There will be multiple of divisions in different genes, mutations in different genes, which will actually cause that cancer to actually be the form it is. And there are, when I say cancer, we probably think of it as I've said it's an abnormal growth, but cancers are of different types. So one is there's an abnormal growth, but it's restricted to the place. This type two is if there's abnormal growth and there is a bigger growth within the same tissue or the same place. The third is there's an abnormal growth and there is a little bit spread nearby. And the fourth is when there's abnormal growth and then abnormal growth is spreading elsewhere in the body. And based on the locations of certain types, <coughs> certain cancers are a bit more dangerous than some of the others. And I think what is more important is the understanding of the genetic mutation, which is the most important thing for a, an oncologist or a cancer specialist, because we need to understand how to treat that cancer. And one of the methods Swamiji just mentioned is cutting off the, the source of blood. So we all know that all our cells of the body are thriving because they're constantly getting a source of blood supply, good blood supply. So one of the things we can do, or one of the type of medicines are where you basically stop or you reduce the blood supply to the cancerous cells and you basically reduce or let the cancerous cells die. And honestly speaking, medicine has, has developed those kind of medicines and those medicines are really, I feel, intelligent where they can so specifically target specific genetic materials within your body and just block the blood supply to the certain cells. So I think that's just one way which we basically can stop the growth of the cancer. There are many other ways like immune system. Our body, as I said, is, is a brilliant machine which is constantly working even when we don't know to keep us safe. And even when there are cells multiplying in our body, <coughs> something within our body will kind of send a signal and there are some helper cells, we call them, who will come and basically kill the abnormal cells. We don't even realize about it. So our body is doing all of that, even without us thinking. But sometimes, as I said, because of these external factors, our body needs help. So I think the immune system in our body is very, very strong. But when that becomes rogue, when the genetic material becomes, <coughs> becomes a bit mutated, that's when cancer cells form. So I think there's a, as I said, there's a, a lot of understanding today about, I mean, I know one of the, one of the cancers I'm currently working on is um, a, a kind of the cancer of the intestine. And when I was in medical school, there was only one gene that I knew was obviously associated with that cancer. And when I was reading recently, there are about 22 genes associated with that type of cancer. So today we know it's not just the one gene that you mostly would need to maybe cause the cancer in the patient. There's lots of factors. So why somebody would get cancer, we don't know. But it's more important to understand what is the defective gene which and which decides which treatment that patient needs and then essentially that doing the holistic management. So I think we are, um, we are in a very privileged position today where cancer research is at top every, in every single country. We've got a very good cancer research facility in India. And I think there's a lot of research happening there. And I think it's, it's very, as I, I'm very excited about being in this field because there's so much I feel I bring to the patient care. Thank you, ma'am. This is quite insightful. Maybe at this point, if I can just bring out a question that you know somebody is asking over here mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the chat box. There's a question which says, if this abnormality of genes, if this is abnormality of genes, does it mean cancer is a genetic disease? And since cells multiply abnormally, can this disease be related to the immune system of the body? So. The main cause of cancer is a genetic cause. 
uh, we and it can be a genetic disease because sometimes you just kind of gain that abnormal genes from your parents when you're born because as i said you get a set of genes from your father and a set of genes from your mother so if they have the abnormal genes then yes you might just have an abnormal pair of genes and you're more prone to having a certain type of cancer and then yes you have a very genetic reason for being uh, developing cancer cancer in itself is not entirely a genetic disease genetic uh, involvement is the most common cause of cancer but there's also involvement of external factors so it's not in in entirety a genetic disease uh, and the other question was since cells multiply abnormally can this disease be related to the immune system of the body yes it's definitely an immune system related disease more so because when the the cells multiply or when the cancer is obviously growing to a state where it's spreading, I think there's a lot of cytokines, chemicals that are released from our cells, which can essentially form complications. So which is why I think it's also an immune system disease. I think I'll put it more on the immune system disease than a genetic disease, because the main factor, yes, it's genetic abnormality which causes cancer, but it's not an entirety a genetic disease. So it's not the only reason that a person will get cancer. Uh, and it's definitely an immune system disease, yes. So then the, the next question, uh, probably yeah. I'll just sum it up, says, uh, he asks, uh, what can be done to cut it in the bud stage? Or how, or how can we prevent this? If it's an immune system disease, what are the things that maybe you know, a layman like us can do to kind of prevent ourselves from getting place in the first i think that is a research which is still ongoing because as i said we don't know a lot of things about why i think the one thing we don't know is yes there are so if you see there might be many patients who would have some genetic mutations and some similar external factors but one patient will develop cancer and the other patient won't one patient will develop as maybe stage three cancer and the other patient a stage one so there's still some things that we don't know. And it's probably the internal patient mechanisms that's actually still unknown to us. So there is something that's still not known to oncologists to be able to see how we can make this a preventable disease. But we have managed to, I mean, medicine world has managed to conquer diseases like polio. I mean, many years ago, when I was born, polio was a disease which cannot be cured, it cannot be conquered. But today, polio is almost unheard of. So I'm pretty sure by the time our kids are 30, 40 years old, cancer will be a preventable disease and there'll be something else on the horizon. But as of today, there's a lot of research ongoing. And maybe Swamiji can add a bit more on to how, what can we do to kind of see uh, make keep ourselves a little bit more I mean in our hands like diet stress uh, and some of the like factors like smoking alcohol that's all in our control so that clearly we can obviously manage that but maybe Swamiji might be able to address a bit on that I don't have an answer to that question unfortunately <laughs> Well, before I guess I'll put it on to Swamiji in a bit. There's one more question, ma'am. Uh, Neela ji is asking, in case of BRCA1, are other women organs better to be removed invariably? Hmm. I think that is a... Um, there, there is a lot of uh, controversial research there. And a lot of patients who I know who have BRCA1 uh, obviously positive, who are told, obviously, they have ongoing screenings to make sure because they are, so BRCA1 is essentially a type of a gene which can cause women cancer. So breast cancer or womb cancer or ovarian cancer. So if you have abnormality in this type of gene and it's more common in women, then you are more prone to developing those kind of women cancer. So just for everybody who don't, don't know what BRCA1 genes are. And there's a lot of clinicians even here who believe, oh, if you have BRCA1, let's remove your breast, let's remove your ovaries. But then it's, again, it goes back to quality of life. Some patients want to have a good quality of life. And it's not, again, it's not every single person who has BRCA1 mutation will have a cancer. So it's really 
I mean, if, if anybody has BRCA1 well mutation, then it's important to have those conversations, to have ongoing screening so that you can, if there is any abnormal growth, then you can catch it straight away. I don't think there's many clinicians left in the world, at least in the Western world that I know of, who will today say that, oh, because you've got BRCA1, well, let's remove all these potential organs which could be cancerous, um, prone to more cancerous growth. So there, it was a very controversial discussion I know was happening, but I think a lot of clinicians now go with the wait and watch approach. But it's important that we do on a regular screening for these patients. All right. Thanks, ma'am. So over Thank to you. Swamiji, maybe you can take it from here. And then after that, maybe we can take RPG's question. Sure, sure. Okay, we'll do Thank that. You. And uh, so in the beginning, I would like to thank Dr. Mayura once again for explaining these concepts so simply and in such a uh, layman terms. I am actually amazed how she has uh, simplified it without making it simplistic. But as she has mentioned, there are lots of limitations in modern medicine with cancer. And um, to begin, I would like to uh, recall a few points which she has mentioned. First is that cancer is a multifactorial disease with genetic mutation at its heart. And there are different substances which induce cancer-like change in the body, which are known as carcinogens. Generally, we speak of physical carcinogens. But there are also mental carcinogens, emotional carcinogens. It has been seen that when there is a same thought which goes on in your mind over and over and over and over and over again, then that thought affects us much in the same manner as if you were exposed to a physical carcinogen as if like tobacco in your, chewing tobacco or smoking cigarettes. It keeps on hurting us bit by bit, forcing the genes to change the expression. Generally, we feel that it is the genes which will direct how everything happens. But now there is research which shows that the gene manifestation expression is also affected to a great degree by the responses and feedback mechanisms from the cytoplasm, the other cell organs. So it is not a one-way street that the genes are the masters and everybody are servants. No, there is a two-way communication which continues. And this two-way communication alters the manifestation of a gene. Second point which I would like to stress upon is that there are multiple gene mutations which are necessary for cancer to start manifesting. And at this time, I would like to uh, mention, and uh, Dr. Mayura, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but cancerous changes keep happening in the body all the time. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. It is nothing new. Cancer is nothing new. So if cancerous changes keep happening in the body all the time, then how is it that everybody is not having cancer all the time? The reason being that our immune system usually mops up all these deficient cells before they can go beyond control. 
And how does that happen? When does it start going beyond control? Dr. Mayura hinted at that. Without changing or without creating newer blood lines which will feed these cancerous cells over giving them priority over the other cells until and unless that does not happen invariably the cancer cannot survive it dies out so uh, you can understand that there are multiple errors in the genetic expression which need to take place if cancer needs to come up why am i stressing so much on the multifactorial aspect the mental carcinogen aspect the emotional carcinogen aspect and the ability of the necessity of multiple genes being needed for manifestation of cancer for a simple reason that therein lies the answer yoga therapy works with this aspect today we know that yogic practices have a very strong impact on the gene manifestation gene expression so as we were discussing earlier you might have a gene the braca gene what was being spoken of just now but every person does not manifest with it why because the internal structure of that person is able to neutralize the predisposition that is what in is necessary in the treatment aspect what can we do we need to look at three or four important things first is diet second is lifestyle third is mental habits and mental patterns and fourth are practices please note i have said fourth are practices everybody would like and love to jump on practices first yes practices are important and many times practices help us bring in lifestyle changes and mental uh, pattern changes but these are more crucial when there is an exertion in the body our immune system is overworked and when our immune system is overworked then it doesn't have enough resources to take care of these small small cancerous growths which are taking place in the body at times and then a growth can start coming up so first let us break that chain second the mental habits as was mentioned earlier there are people who have never smoked a cigarette have never been exposed to too much of pollution yet they come up with lung cancer so cigarettes cannot be the only cause there have to be other causes there has been phenomenal amount of research wherein the hormones which determine our responses and our emotional state they have been found to have an impact on cancer there is a wonderful book called molecules of emotion where this has been spoken in great detail so when there are unresolved emotions unresolved mental issues and they keep on prodding and pricking us internally that can bring about a cancerous change in the body as i had spoken in the morning there are five dimensions of existence the body is the final visible level but you have subtler dimensions problems can start there and eventually manifest here yogic practices 
diet, lifestyle habits, and mental health patterns, they allow us to cut these problems at that level. And then even if you have a predisposition to cancer, you will not get cancer. It has been seen that there is a genetic mutation which is there in the mother or in the father, but the parent doesn't have cancer. In the child, the child becomes more predisposed, but still doesn't have cancer. And sometimes in the third generation, all the mutations needed come together and cancer manifests. We, our aim in yoga therapeutics is to cut this chain of mutations. That is the first prong. The second prong is to improve the energy in the body, the pranic energy level in the body. When the pranic energy starts increasing in the body, then automatically the ability of the body starts going up. The third is to improve the balance between the bodies. There is a certain specific rhythm in the body. We all would have heard of the word circadian rhythms. The rhythm with which every body organ operates is slightly different. And whole body in itself works in a specific rhythm. Thanks to our modern lifestyle, lots of lights, light, lots of uh, uh, unnatural timings. I have heard of people, they don't go to bed till 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning. Things like this create a lot of stress on the human physiology. They predispose us to cancer. So wherever there is a weak link, it will come up. They say that the chain is strong, only as strong as it is at the weakest link. Cancerous changes keep on looking at the weakest link. And when there is this type of stress, when there is multiple other things coming in, the weakest link breaks and cancer comes up. So, this is something which is very essential for us to understand. Obviously, we cannot cover everything in such a short period of time. But between Dr. Mayura and myself, we have tried to give you two different aspects. And once we look at these two aspects, then we come to know that cancer is a serious ailment. It was less common earlier. Now it has become very common. That is because of the wrong lifestyle which has come in. However, once it affects us, only changes in lifestyle might not be sufficient. So they need to be supplemented with appropriate diet, with appropriate medications. At this point, I would like to emphasize that while yoga in itself has the ability to cure cancer on its own, we do not advise patients to stop other forms of medication. That is because when we have already been stricken by cancer, our body is not in a state that we can start practicing yoga in its form which is needed. So therefore, we are, unable, we are unable to reach that level. And when we are unable to reach that level, then the effect might not be seen. And most importantly, it is our life at stake. It is not the dogma that allopathy is better or homeopathy is better or Ayurveda is better or this pathy is better or that pathy is better. No, it is the life and the quality of the patient which is most important. And 
yogic therapeutics has the best advantage that it can go in seamlessly with almost any form of therapy be it chemotherapy be it radiotherapy be it surgery be it immuno therapy be it targeted cells whatever it might be yoga can have an amazing result at the best uh, at the least it can reduce your side effects it can improve the quality of life it can balance your emotional status but that is not all yoga can actually change the ability of the body to respond and we have so many examples of people who have gone to stage 4 they have been told that well we really can't do much for you and then they have come back from there and today they are leading normal lives of course these cases are not very common but they do exist and with an appropriate correct judicious combination of yogic practices diet lifestyle mental health patterns and medications we will very easily be able to conquer the disease at this point i would again like to re, uh, bring back the message which i mean i i i liked the way dr mayura put it cancer is a disease which affects one person but paralyzes the entire family the entire family even today even today after so many advances in cancer the moment a patient learns that oh he has or she has cancer it is as if somebody has signed a death warrant there is i mean the priorities of life change overnight there is panic there is anxiety there everything sets in that is not related to cancer per se but until and unless we don't manage those aspects cancer is not going to go away because emotions have a very powerful role in management of cancer and not just on the emotional and psychological level but emotions have an impact on the physiology of the body emotions have an impact on your immune system emotions have an impact on the digestion the metabolism everything we know when we are not feeling good when we are feeling depressed when we are feeling down either we lose our appetite totally or we keep grabbing food to compensate what does that indicate emotions have a very clear physiological bodily manifestation this is the aspect that we need to focus upon the quality of life of the patient and the quality of life for the caregiver unfortunately there is so much of emphasis which is given on the patient very correctly but the caregiver who has to undergo so much of trauma who has to suppress his or her own fears anxieties and stand strong so that the patient can be taken care of who is taking care of that person who is telling that my dear you need to take care of yourself otherwise you will fall sick that is not happening as much as it should that is the other aspect because we need to know that human beings are not individual beings no matter what we speak of uh, my privacy and your privacy and my space and your space but human beings are not individual creatures human beings are creatures which are which live in communities they are social creatures and in a society family is a small society a group of people staying together is a small society and behavior and 
in impact of one P person in that affects the other. So if I am a caregiver and there is a patient, the patient observes the health of the caregiver, observes the mental trauma, observes the financial trauma, everything. And do you think that does not have an impact on the healing ability of the patient? No, it does. Until and unless we look at the different aspects, there is no way that we can win this war with cancer. If cancer is a multifactorial disease, then the way to overcome cancer has to be multi-pronged approach. And prevention is always better than cure. Why do we have to wait till cancer strikes us? If we know that there are these many factors which predispose us to cancer, why can we not start implementing small incremental changes in our lives so that cancer does not affect us at all? Yes, we may or may not be predisposed, but that potential does not actually manifest. It remains a potential and it gets neutralized by other things. This is how one needs to approach therapy for cancer. And it has to be person-based, case-to-case basis. It cannot be one size, fit, one size fits all. Every case is unique and it needs to be looked in the same manner. So this is how yoga can offer very clear solutions, but in addition to in supplementing the modern medicines. Please do not, please do not either do yourself or tell anyone that, oh, if you are doing yoga, you don't need to take any other medicines. No, that's not true. Please take the medicines, even if there are side effects. Yoga will help you reduce the side effects. Yoga will help you increase the quality of life. Yoga will help improve the ability of the body to heal, regenerate and repair itself. Thereby assisting modern medications. And if you are a lucky person who has been practicing yoga for a long time, then you will be most probably blessed by not having cancer itself because you are preventing the causes from taking root. This is what we need to keep in mind when we speak of yoga and cancer. With this, I would like to conclude my talk. And if there are any questions for either Dr. Mayura or myself, we are very happy to take any questions. Can I just add something, Samiji? What you mentioned about the uh, immunological influence, the immu emotions which obviously impact our immune system. It's very interesting because I was reading something a few days ago where I read like cancer per se doesn't kill a person. It's basically the complications from it. And the complications happen because of what I was saying earlier is the chemicals which are released from my immune system, which essentially target specific organs, um, because cancer cells will not essentially go and block organs. It's these immune chemical reactions that happen almost in the body. So I think it makes so much sense uh, that we need to kind of manage our emotions and anxiety in that situation. So yes. thank you. Yes, I agree. I agree. Uh, in that sense, uh, modern science, modern medicine is now looking at multifactorial aspects, but unfortunately still they're looking basically only around the body. But there is so much more. There is the energetic aspect, the energetic component that needs to be taken into consideration. 
modern medicine still hasn't reached there but yoga can support and it can support amazing fantastic results can be achieved so therefore i think that uh, a combination is always good thank you swami ji thank you dr mayura swami ji this is uh, this is very reassuring to hear that yoga is definitely should be looked as a prevention rather than just a cure isn't it for for, for cancer yes yes and uh, again i would like to tell you what i had mentioned in the beginning that please remember cancerous changes happen in every person's body it is not that only some people are stricken with cancer no cancerous changes take place in every person's body the only thing is is the body able to mop it up in time before it can actually create too much of damage make it self limiting and then heal and repair it quickly when the body is able to do that cancer can't hurt us when the body is not able to do that then cancer comes in and it can sometimes take very aggressive forms so therefore it is very certainly it's easily possible theoretically easily possible to prevent cancer to manage cancer and even to come back from second stage third stage sometimes even fourth stage not everybody can do that but it can thank you swami ji there's one question i think dr mayura uh, uh, what makes the genes mutate um i mean there are some factors external factors uh, which we know like uh, there are certain chemicals or diet stress um, uv radiation smoking so these are some factors we know but there are quite a few factors which we don't know cause these genes to mutate obviously hereditary could be one as i said if you've already got a bad gene from a father and a mother it could happen that you might just be predisposed to developing cancer but there are quite a few factors which we don't know but again few years back we only knew of smoking and ultraviolet radiation has been main causes of cancer but today we know there's lots of other things such as diet stress i think stress is one of the upcoming ones which we see more and more common in patients so i think those are the kind of the known factors thank you dr mayura rinmai ji i hope that answers your question swami ji this question is for you shivendra ji wants to know about the yoga therapy that is applied on cancer patients in uh, munger and also explain about yes. the results there you see uh, this time uh, time which we have now is not sufficient to go into details but uh, a lot of research has happened at munger and uh, also at different parts in the world where uh, the it has been shown that a combination of yogic practices meditative practices yoga nidra diet has an enormous impact on the healing and i am not just speaking about the emotional aspect i am speaking about proper healing so uh, in a nutshell there is a lot of research which is going on and a lot of research is still happening so therefore it won't be very appropriate to you know come ahead and give results that this happens but there is very very encouraging results which come in especially like i would like to from my personal experience if you are having radiotherapy if you are having chemotherapy and you supplement it with appropriate pranayam before after if you supplement it with appropriate visualization practices in yoga nidra or in meditative practices that can have an amazing result 
I know of patients who have learned this art of proper visualization and they have reduced the level of side effects and increased the level of, uh, tar you know, we speak of targeted therapy nowadays. The molecules of the medicines are created in such a manner that they will target only the specific cells, which are the cancerous cells in the body. But you will be very surprised to know that using visualization techniques, you can improve the delivery of the drug to specific areas in the body. And that is an amazing result. With appropriate pranayam, you can improve the immune system. You can reduce the, uh, the uh, what would we say, the side effects which come with chemotherapy. Because ke when we take undertake chemotherapy or radiotherapy, our immune system takes a big hit. That is a known side effect. Lots of efforts are underway and plenty of progress has happened. But still, immune system undergoes a very, very massive uh, blow. It, it takes a big blow with pranayam and with yoga nidra and visualization. You can have very good results, but we need to do more research in it to be able to prove it because research needs to be done in appropriate manner. Just anecdotal experiences are not sufficient and that research is underway. So we should wait for the results to come in, but experience shows and studies have shown that there is very good impact, very, very encouraging impact. And uh, yeah, if there is, there is a scope for research with these activities, I think we need to undertake more research in that so that we can have better responses and better results. There was also, I believe, Arti was wanting, Arti had wanted to ask a question. Yes, Swamiji. Arti ji, please pose your question. Um, actually, uh, Swamiji already has spoke about what I was going to say, that the uh, pranayama and other practices uh, play a major role. Uh, also, uh, I feel that uh, since the root, one of the root causes probably is more psychological, I think uh, the stress sh should be more uh, on psychotherapy or uh, many times uh, it's uh, been observed uh, that a person goes through traumatic experiences like a person loses his spouse or her spouse and after a few years she has cancer or he has cancer so the root cause is is the probably the disturbance of the uh, you know mm -hmm. body structure mm -hmm. yeah. right so uh, i read some books i mean um, i lost my father and brother uh, to cancer uh, some very close friends to cancer also. So I read some books and uh, a friend of ours, we lost to uh, geoblastoma, which is considered very deadly uh, brain cancer. Um, and I read in this book, the I sent a message that there is a book called Cured by Dr. Jeffrey Rediger. And he has given... Uh, examples of people who had brain cancer and who followed different therapies and cured themselves. I'm not saying it's a high percentage, but even if it's a minimal, uh, whatever percentage there is, the stress should be more on uh, maybe alternative therapies, which will help uh, to uh, 
everyone. That's what I thought. I'm not a medical expert, so sorry. I agree if, with uh, you. I'm saying more uh, than what I should. Yes. No, no. I agree with you fully. And I believe in uh, recent times, uh, Dr. Mayura can uh, tell better, but there is an increased emphasis on alternative therapies. Unfortunately, with alternative therapies, we also have to be very careful. Sometimes they promise us the moon. Sometimes anything and everything. Because please remember that we are speaking of huge money and huge emotions. So people take us for a ride. Mm -hmm. And we cannot uh, you know, turn a blind eye to that. At the same time, there are some uh, therapies which can be good for some people but won't work for some other people until and unless we don't develop a correct understanding of how it is working. It is not safe to apply it to all people. So we need to study it. We need to understand it properly and apply it. And yes, when it is done that way, then it has got amazing results. What do you think, Dr. Mehra? I agree. I think uh, many years ago, um, there was nothing called as psycho-oncology. Even, like, even if I go five years back, there was not a field called psycho-oncology. And now whenever I, go in, whenever I go to conferences or when I'm talking to clinicians, they are talking about <clears throat> psycho-oncology because they know what Swamiji has already explained, that the mind is playing a big factor in the way your body is reacting. And there's a lot of research done which might not be necessarily in cancer, but other conditions where you know that your mind is kind of dictating how your body is going to react to the disease, to a treatment. So there's a lot of help now being given to the patients on how to manage their anxiety and stress to be able to get the best out of their treatment. So I completely agree. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Mayura, the next question is from Chitra Bhanuji. She wants to know, is it important to get di diagnosis through multiple tests? Dragonized. I think that's <laughs> what the word says, you dragonized. <laughs> no, I think that was a diagnosis. <laughs> it is diagnosis. <laughs> oh, diagnosis. <laughs> yeah. So, but I it's think the cancer is that I'm dragonized in my head. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, um, yeah, through multiple tests, isn't symptomatic treatment possible as it saves money, time, and trauma? That was something even I was thinking. Like, you know, just because we go for these diabetes tests and regular t yearly tests. Isn't it more a way where we start going for these tests for cancer, ma'am? Um, if there are certain genes, like, for example, if you have a BRCA mutation in running in your family, or if you know that you have a particular mutation running in your family, then I don't know how it is currently in India, but in the Western world, you can ask for an annual screening. That doesn't prevent you from developing cancer, but at least then it will hopefully be able to help the clinician whenever you find the first signs of cancer. Um, but I don't think on a daily basis you want to put yourself because the, the best way to diagnose a cancer is actually through biopsy of the tissue. So when you take the cells out and you put them under a microscope and you actually see what those cells are made up of. So unless everybody wants the, the clinician to go in and take cells out of their body, it's just not physically possible. So I think the, the way the cancer is diagnosed through biopsy makes it slightly difficult for everybody to have it as an ongoing screening method. But if you have a particular mutation which is commonly running in your family, then yes, I think we should ask for annual screening. Um, but other question was about, I think you said about symptomatic treatment. I think that's what we do with cancer. I think we do the treatment, which is, so whatever symptoms you have, we treat them. Because as I said, like when I was reading, like nobody dies from cancer as it is, if you die normally from the complications of it. And the, the treatment that we give have loads of side effects and that requires more treatment than actually the treatment for the cancer. So 
it's a very strange disease area. And as I said, we need to do a lot more in this. How do we get to that stage where it's absolutely symptomatic treatment and we are still able to manage the cancer growth or the cancerous growth? We are not there yet. But it will be very nice if we can get there. I would like to add that there are two or three aspects. First is that we have explained about cancer and we have simplified the material so that it is easy to understand. Please understand that it is not so easy or simple. It is very, very complex. But we have just you know, made it easy for us to get the basic concept. Secondly, Cancer does not happen overnight. Cancer happens when we are making mistakes over years, sometimes over decades. So, uh, do we really need to wait till the manifestation starts coming in, or that we start taking the tests? We don't need to wait. We can start making those corrections right away in our lives. Incrementally, let us make a change. We can't make a massive change. When you have a ship going through the sea, if the ship needs to change course and say, suppose it needs to turn around, it cannot turn around right away. It will need few miles or maybe even uh, tens of miles because the ship can only move so much because of its bulk. Our bulk, the karmic balance, the mental habit balance, they don't allow us to change quickly. So we need to undertake incremental changes so that it doesn't create too much of stress within us. But when we start doing that, then this change can take place and then we can avoid like what was being said about uh, so much of money also is being spent. True. A lot of money is spent and many times it is not fruitful either. But in modern medicine, this is the best we can offer. So to make the best of both, we need to try getting it into the preventive aspect. That will help. Thank you, Swamiji. There's one more question for you, Swamiji, by Nidhiji. She says, Swamiji, please give some guidance on how to manage and control anxiety. Simple. First thing, do abdominal breathing, deep abdominal breathing. Place your right or left palm on the abdomen and just inhale and exhale. Let us do it ourselves. Please, everybody sit down. If you are in a chair, sit straight with both the feet on the ground. If you are able to sit in a meditative posture, sit in a meditative posture. Bring your awareness on your breath. And as I breathe in, Become aware of the different experiences in the process of inhalation and exhalation. As I inhale, I become aware of the coolness at the nose tip, air rushing up the nostrils, down the throat, down the chest, down the abdomen, a short pause, up the abdomen, up the chest, up the throat, down the nose, warm air leaving the nostrils, a short pause, and the whole sequence repeats itself. Now, shift your awareness to the movement of your chest and abdomen. As you inhale, become aware of the movement in the abdomen and the chest. And as you exhale, observe what is the movement. Now place your right palm on the abdomen near your navel and try and localize the movement only in the abdomen. And as you inhale, consciously let your abdomen expand. And as you exhale, let the abdomen fall back, contract. We are breathing normally, no effort in the breathing. Just we are aware that we are expanding the abdomen and contracting the abdomen. Inhale, expand, exhale, 
contract. Inhale, expand, exhale, contract. Inhale, expand, exhale, contract. Now, bring the hand back to your knee. Breathe normally. And observe the effect of this practice on the mind before and after. And after you observe the impact, then gently open your eyes. So, who, who had asked this question about controlling anxiety? Nidhi ji had asked. And I think it's a very doable thing, Swamiji. Thank you so much. Anywhere, anytime we can do this. Yes, this is, and, and this is just one thing. There, there are multiple uh, things which can be done, but this is something I'm using abdominal breath because it is something which anybody can do anytime because nobody can say, I don't have time to do it. We breathe all the time. The only thing is we just have to become aware of that and, you know, modulate it accordingly. And you will see the stress levels come down, the anxiety comes down, the ability, the clarity comes up. Many things start happening. So this is one of the simplest. And then there are others also, including Hamari Pranayam, including Shashankasan, including, uh, uh, say, Bhujangasan. But then uh, we need to look into the ability of the patient also. Uh, they, they can have, if they have got a backache or a bad back or something, we need to be careful with this. But this is something which has no contract. One more question from Aarti ji, uh, Dr. Mayura. Uh, she wants to know, is yearly mammogram more helpful or hurtful? I mean, they are uncomfortable uh, in, in a as a procedure, but uh, they are um, helpful because they help identify um, any abnormal growth at a very early stage. Uh, the problem with uh, why a lot of the cancers are getting diagnosed so late on is because as Swami you already mentioned is it's, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot of time and by the time actually some symptom comes, it's probably you're already at stage two. There's already some spread here or there. And to avoid that, when you want to be a prevention, it's it to be easiest ways to kind of diagnose or kind of catch those abnormal growth at the stage. They're definitely helpful. I think there was also a few papers published in the past where mammograms have been able to diagnose um, breast cancers at an early stage and prevent um, kind of recurrence. And because obviously we have the mammograms, breast cancers is one of the cancers that is not that deadly anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not very fatal. So they are uncomfortable, but they're definitely helpful. More than uh, comfortable, uncomfortable. I was uh, yes. wondering about the radiation. Uh, how much radiation does uh, you know does a person get every time she goes for a mam mammogram? I think it's 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 not that mammograms will cause you a, a breast cancer or a, a type of a cancer. And I think there's different types of radiations as well. So I think we probably assume all radiations to be of the same UV type. But I think mammograms, I haven't read anywhere that mammograms, just because you've have, had an annual mammogram, you are more prone to developing a particular type of cancer. So maybe that's a, a kind of a, uh, not the right message that has been kind of communicated. In, in the field of cancer, as Swami has already mentioned, there's a lot of education still needed because there's a lot of gaps in our own understanding where I think some of the some of the things which might not be 100% true kind of then make us scared about all these things. But essentially, I have not seen or read any papers where mammograms have caused, the radiation from mammograms have caused to have a cancer. So they are uncomfortable, but I haven't read anything like that. It I was wondering about it being a contributing factor, not a total reason, but a contributing factor to... Uh, no, for... I don't think that 
is one of the contributing factors. But if you are already having, a, say, for example, a BRCA gene, which is a type of mutation is more prone to breast cancers, then it's almost like a catch-22. Just because you had a mammogram, is that the reason you got the cancer or because you have the abnormal gene? So okay. you will never be able to then determine what was the, yes. the, of course, the cause. But as I said, like I've not read any kind of scientific evidence. I've not read anywhere that the radiation from mammogram will cause cancers. But then, as you, as I've just said, it, you don't know what's causing what because there's obviously that mutated gene, which is because of why you're having the regular mammograms. Okay. So I guess the uh, best uh, way would be to have the golden mean, not to go into excess on either side. You know, yeah. so uh, the golden mean, I believe, is the most helpful at this point. Of time. We also have Kalpana Ji. She'd like to share her experience. Kalpana Ji, please unmute yourself. Uh, namaste, Swami Ji. And uh, hello to Dr. Mayura. Uh, when we have not even started a discussion at that time, I have joined and you started saying ki, live with it. And Swamiji had a different thing that like, uh, uh, how it should be live it. Like, you know, like, so I feel live with it is better to leave it. Just leave it behind. That's what I feel. The reason being ki, I was diagnosed for the same in 2011 and as you are discussing i felt uh, many of the patients when i was undertaking a uh, treatment like chemo was on radio radio uh, treatment was on so all these things were on and at that time i was surprised when i was diagnosed at that time my daughter was having 10 standard boards in india is board exam is like wow like everybody is, you know, like the whole family is after that board uh, student life. So at that time I was diagnosed and uh, when the reports I have got at that time, everyone was like family was paralyzed kind of thing. And I was the most stable person in the house. And I must say and agree with Swamiji that if you have a background of yoga, if you have that mental strength, then you are stable in any situation. So that, that is what I experienced at that particular moment. Because there were so many things happening around you because of your reports. And this is 2011 and I'm in front of you. And whenever I was going for the treatment, all the 32 days for the radiations when I was going, I went alone to take that treatment. And I used to go there, I used to come back and the people around me who were waiting in the queue, they used to look at me and they used to say, oh, is that you who is going to take the treatment? Because if you have a positive approach, I think cancer or maybe any other disease cannot beat you. That is what so I true. feel. So true. And so I, I, really, I really feel you know, why to... Uh, get scared with the word that cancer and I really felt that because my approach towards my life is uh, like life you can make it only 10% and remaining 90% how you take it so this what samskar I got it from my parents the strong mental stability what I got is from my parents and as you get the cancer through genes, that's what Dr. Mayura is saying. The same time, these genes which I have got from my uh, ancestors, from my family, they are also equally important. And when I now I am doing my master's in yoga shastra, why I have turned toward this? Because uh, in 80, 1985, I met Hatha Yogi, Dr. Nikam Guruji, that is uh, uh, in Thane. Uh, he is running that he was running he's no more now my guru is not more like but he had like you know uh, inculcated some uh, curiosity in me about yoga and because of that it was in like I was doing it as much I can do but I never thought that this is going to be like in future I'll be adopting it 
and when now the last few months like last two three months yeah two months back my doctor told me ki now we cannot give you any more treatment kalpana okay so our uh, treatment now your treatment we have to stop okay so it is like a, uh, you know like alarm for me ki now i am on my own yeah there i have gone back to my bucket list like last year and i thought ki okay one fine day it is going to stop so let me think about it ki how i am going to manage it in future see one thing is perfectly my fundas you can say this word <laughs> are very clear about myself and the life they are like no one can change my day of my the last date or the death you can say that is very very clear and why i am here why i have taken the birth there is some reason behind it and unless and uh, unless and until i complete that duty of mine that karma i am not going to leave this world that concept is fixed in my mind so i am so strong that no one can uh, draw a lifeline for me no doctors no scientists and nobody else i really feel that that is now it's me who is going to focus he what exactly the remaining whatever is a lifeline of mine what exactly i want to do with that time span and there i have taken this you know yoga from my bucket list and started with it ki let me at least learn the upanishada veda what they were saying and this positivity what i was having through omkara sadhana which i have got it from my mother she is now 80 years old and she is teaching without taking a single penny she is teaching it to everybody who comes to her so i took it and i learned it she is my guru and that omkara sadhana has helped me out during all this treatment and um, my positive uh, positivity that credit goes to that the nama japa which i do my guru is shri brahma chaitanya gondavlekar maharaj and he has given that positivity to me he, he is there that bhakti yoga that nama japa all these things are standing behind me as a strong pillar what else no, i i i will not say they are standing behind you as a strong pillar they are like a kavach yes yes i felt it many of the times like as you said just few minutes back he we are talking it very generally about this topic but the person who goes under it with the treatment chemotherapy how it affects you you just collapse like this for a second you don't know what you were before and what you are i have undergone all these experiences but every moment i used to feel little low and my mind used to jump like you know like a ball and say ki come on kalpana get back to the, your different thoughts and this is the way i have treated myself during that phase and that is what i was waiting for that uh, i would like to share it with all of you uh, that as mayura doctor is working upon it when she felt like her close like person like mother she is suffering then she has turned towards this so this is what happens then when you are yourself going through it i feel uh, instead of focusing on i am having ca is better if you have ca that is just a part of your life as you have your bp as you have your sugar as you have something else thyroid take it that Not way as, and as then you are out of it you might you might be of a short stature or long stature that is a weakness or that can be a strength similarly the cancer is there and over here i would like to really bring out three or four important points today yoga is being spoken all over the world but if you look at it 50 60 80 90 years ago the yogic principles were lived all throughout you did not really have to do anything specific you just have to live the life as we were taught and all those things 
start coming in automatically. That was the yogic lifestyle which we received in heritage. That Absolutely. was the positive mental outlook which we received in our heritage. And unfortunately, we are some of us have lost it, some of us are losing it, or some of us are gaining it back. We have to try and leapfrog ahead, uh, jump ahead of those mistakes of others, look at others, learn from their mistakes, and pick it up. That is what is a yogic lifestyle, which was the backbone of India. So that is something which is very essential. And then comes the spiritual aspect. The spiritual aspect. We have purposely not touched upon, but you, as you have brought in Nam, Nama Japa is something which is very, very powerful, amazing. And uh, not only for the spiritual aspect, but even mantra in itself yes. has got an, a very strong impact on all our chakras, on all, on the Kundalini Shakti. Everything comes in. Of course, it comes in small uh, doses not much. So, uh, all these things together come in and uh, on behalf of all the participants and delegates and organizers and everybody, I would like to congratulate Kalpana for a remarkable uh, journey and uh, let this be an uh, inspiration for all. And uh, perhaps we can uh, Involve if uh, let's see uh, we, we can take her uh, experiences and share it with others because that way people feel more enthused because they see that oh if she has got cancer and she has been able to come out of it I can also it Swamiji I'm sorry to interrupt you okay. uh, uh, this is you know that is why I have taken this uh, yoga MA. That is why I've taken it because I really want to know. Now my remaining journey, I do not know. I have left it to my guru. Wherever they are taking me, I'm going ahead. Okay. The only thing what I feel is whatever rest of the life, I am already teaching like uh, Omkari Sadhana to others, like same like my mom without charging anything. One fine day, I was just sitting peacefully and I felt somewhere. He, what is now the goal of my life? And then I realized he whatever my experience I have undergone, let me transfer this energy to others. Yes. And for doing that, uh, for doing that, I am doing it like I'm teaching Omkar Sajana to others. At the same time, I felt if I want to keep myself in a good health because of the treatment, I have got many physical uh, restrictions, many troubles, which like calcium lacking, this, that, blah, blah, blah. I just don't want to discuss all this because I think it is mm. not required to discuss. It's okay. Now, if I want to treat myself with the yoga, first is I have to take my health as a priority. There I felt somewhere, if I join someone else's class, just every nook and corner, I see the yoga classes nowadays. Just two months training and they start new yoga class. I just don't want to be a part of that. I want in-depth knowledge where it will reach to my heart and my brain, which will be accepted by my, you know, like uh, that uh, intelligence. And then only I can, when, if I adopt it, then only I can transfer it to others. That's what I feel. So I really feel if you and your uh, community can guide me on this, I will be really grateful for that. So, and uh, Dr. Mayura, she's so young and uh, she's working upon it. So, my all the blessings and uh, best wishes to her. Thank you. You're Thank definitely. you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, certainly, Kalpana, you can be in touch. Uh, uh, Bandana, if you can put in the uh, email, support at satyamsumiran.org and we can uh, continue our uh, talk uh, over there. And uh, yes, uh, this has been an amazing journey and uh, there is so much more. And it is only for this that I have decided that it is not sufficient to have a Satyam Yuga conclave every month because in one hour, we cannot cover everything. There are so many things which are left unattended. And for that, 
uh, we have decided that we will be having a follow-up workshop. The, on 6th and 7th, we will be having a follow-up workshop on cancer, a in-detailed workshop. Then next week, we will be having on women's health. Third week, we will be having on lifestyle disorders. And by that fourth week comes in when we will be ready for the next session of the Satyam Yoga Conflict. And uh, here, uh, taking the cue from Kalpana, I would like to mention that yoga is a very powerful science. Please do not drag it down to just being a physical practice. Don't pull it down to aerobics or gym or uh, you know something like that. They themselves, exercises are very good, beneficial. But yoga works at a very, very different dimension. It works on the physiology. It works on the psychology. It works on the transcendental aspect of our being. So uh, we need to understand that. And uh, this is a this year the birth centenary of Swami Satyananda is dedicated towards bringing up this aspect of yoga. Now, as uh, you mentioned, something which Swamiji had mentioned many years ago. Swamiji had said in Hindi, Nukkad Nukkad Par Jis Prakar Se Paan Thele Ka Dukaan Hota Hai Vaise Nukkad Nukkad Par Yoga Classes That is true. But then, those classes are not about the correct aspect and correct direction of yoga. So I think now we need to understand and we need to go greater depths of yoga. And the whole effort of Satyam Yoga Conclave is to bring about this change in awareness. And if that can happen, then I would say that these Satyam Yoga Conclaves are a success. Just uh, coming here, talking is not the count of success. When a change comes in the collective psyche, that is the parameter of success. And let us all work towards it. That is the real tribute to the masters because they don't need our uh, mm, felicitations. What they need is that we imbibe those teachings in our lives and make a difference in our life. That and that alone is a tribute to the masters. And please know that all the masters are one. In the same way as electricity in your house, my house, his house, her house, anybody's house is actually the same. It comes through a different meter in everybody's house. But energy is the same. And the same way, Guru is fun. Guru is the Guru Tattva. And that manifests in hundreds of forms. Because when there is a person who can connect with that higher form and transmit it, to people like us, such people become the Guru. And they transmit the same electricity, whether it be in Bombay or in Delhi or in Patna or Kolkata or in UK or in USA. Electricity is just the same. In the same way, Gurus all over the world are the same because they are people who can connect to the higher level and bring it to a lower level so that we can experience it and understand it. And this Satyam Yoga Conclave is a dedication to Swamiji. And uh, with this, we are already, I believe, 15 minutes beyond 9 o'clock. We have run over. But I think it was worthwhile. And uh, let us chant Shanti part. Uh, have you put in the uh, email? Yeah, you can put in... Uh, satyamsumiran at gmail.com or support at satyamsumiran.org. Both of it. All right, Swamiji. Please sit in any comfortable meditative posture. Hands on your knees in Jnana or Chin Mudra. 
head, neck, shoulders, back in a straight line, eyes and mouth gently closed. Become aware of the whole body from the top of your head to your toes. Awareness of your head, neck, shoulders, arms, chest, upper back, abdomen, lower back, hips, legs, the whole body. Shift your awareness to your breath. Normal spontaneous breathing coupled with awareness. I am breathing in and I know I am aware I am breathing in. I am breathing out and I know I am aware I am breathing out. Let this be the form of your awareness for a few moments. Bring your awareness to your eyebrow center, blue madhya. And here, visualize the form of either your guru or your ishtadevata or your psychic symbol or a brightly burning candle flame. Whatever be the icon you choose, let your mind gravitate towards it. Maintaining your awareness at this, we shall chant the mantra Om three times, followed by Shantipa. Take a deep breath in. Om. Together, Asatoma Sadgamaya, Tamasoma Jotir Gamaya. Mrityor Mamrutam Gamaya Sarvesham Swasti Bhavatu Sarvesham Shantir Bhavatu Sarvesham Purnam Bhavatu Sarvesham Mangalam Bhavatu Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu Om Tremba Kamya Jamahe Sugandim Pushti Vardhanam Urva Rukaniva Bandhanam Rutyor Mukshiyam Amrutat Om Shanti 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 Hands in Pranamudra Vameva mata chapita tvameva tvameva bandhusha sakha tvameva tvameva vidya dravinam tvameva tvameva sarvam mama deva deva tvameva sarvam mama deva deva tvameva sarvam Mama Deva Deva Hari Ho Hari Ho Tatsat Gently rub your palms against each other. Place them on the closed eyes. Experience the warmth radiating from your palms to your eyes, to the brain, to the whole body. And then gently move the palms away. Open your eyes. Aryom <coughs> Namo Narayan Jai Namo Narayan Swamiji uh, Namo Narayan to everyone Dr. Mayura, thank you so much for taking out this time and it's been a beautiful session we have all gained so much and such a positive inspiring story from Kalpanaji also and Swamiji's insights too so I think um, 
uh, you know, we have so many takeaways from today's session um, and the power of the mind in case, you know, things go wrong in our life. Uh, on that note, we will all meet you tomorrow morning, continuing the Satyam Conclave session with Swamiji. Uh, uh, and Swamiji I and everybody, thank you very much. And uh, we are now upcoming, our exams are there. So I may not join now, but uh, once I find time, I'm going to get back to you people. So excuse me for that. Thank certainly, you so much. Certainly, certainly. Yes, thank you. Thank and you. Uh, I believe that there were some people who have joined in new and uh, there are people who have just joined in. I noticed somebody joined in just at uh, five minutes ago. So, uh, mm, you can get in touch with us on the emails uh, which have been mentioned. Uh, I think, uh, Vandana, could you please post them again? Because those who joined in, when we, doing, yeah, when we were doing Shanti part, I noticed somebody just joined in. So they can. And uh, we will continue our discussion tomorrow morning, tomorrow evening, and take it further from there. For now, we can conclude. Namo Narayan. Namunarayan Swamiji. Namunarayan Swamiji.